questions about the test? Um, if you want to look it over, we can talk about it next time, too. Uh, yes. Sure. Oh, okay. So, okay, so we know um, that, uh, so this bike has a wheel diameter So the wheel diameter is 0.72 meters. Um, and the bike is moving with a constant velocity of 8 meters per second. Um, I don't know why it says constant speed if it's going to, if the idea is that it's stopping, but um, it stops over a distance. Whenever uh, there's something that doesn't make sense in the problems, I change my language like, like this is just some problem that the universe created and I'm just going to have to deal with it. Uh, okay, so stops over a distance. of 10 meters. Um, what's the angular acceleration of the wheels? Uh, bikes also have uh, seat tubes, seat post. Rider. Saddle. Some sometimes they have a rider. It could be this could be a ghost. What do you call that? Ghost ride it? Yeah. Um. Okay. So, so what do we know? Um. We know that the at the instant before it starts to slow down. Um. The velocity of the center, that's the velocity of the overall bicycle, is 800. Zero, zero, and that's equal to um, negative omega r, 0, 0. So negative omega times point. Three six. Um, so omega is equal to um, negative eight divided by point three six. Can someone divide that for me? What? Negative 22.22, right? OK. OK, so this is radians per second. Uh, that's like the starting speed of it. And, well, I don't know if we're even going to have to use that now that I think about it. So, and now we know that it stops over 10 meters. Uh, well, you can figure out um, if the acceleration in the x direction 
as a function of time is constant, because we're assuming that. And that's equal to dv dt. Um, so v is equal to at plus some constant, and that constant is going to be the velocity at time zero. Um, and then if you integrate again, you get the position is equal to, okay, you know what's easier than doing this integration is just uh, like, yeah, looking it up in your physics one book. But um, if you didn't do that, then you would integrate this. And then you would combine those two, eliminate t, and you'd get 2a times the quantity p minus p0 is equal to v squared minus v0 squared. So those three equations you've seen a bunch, I'm sure. Um, and so uh, use that first one to solve for t. So express t in terms of velocity and acceleration and v0. And then plug that into the second one. You have to do a bunch of algebra to simplify it, but you get this thing. And so then we have 2a times the quantity. Um, we'll call p0, 0. p then would be positive 10. It stopped, so at time t, uh, the speed is 0. And v0 is 8. So we have 20a is equal to negative 64. So a is equal to 3.2. OK, so the acceleration vector is uh, Negative three point two zero zero, and that's the acceleration of the center of the wheel. And so that's equal to negative alpha r zero zero. Um, R is 0 0.36. So we have question? OK. That's what alpha is? OK, so alpha is equal to positive 8.89 uh, radians per second squared. Um, This is a planar problem, so if you want to express it as a vector, that's a positive value in the z direction. So that first thing we didn't use, I was just warming up. Uh, any questions about that one? Any other homework questions? Yes. Oh, vectors. Okay. Uh, do you have it with you? Or does anybody?
Okay, so vector is number 16. Um, so we have this J-shaped thing. Um, and the center of mass is given. And the center of mass is where the origin is located. And then we're given coordinates of the point P. Um, this is 0 0.05, uh, negative 0.2. And then this is the point A, and its coordinates are 0 0.6, 0 0.4. Um, and then the cable here connects to a point B. We don't know what that is yet. Uh, but we know that this angle is 45 degrees. Um, and we want to first figure out an expression for the cable force that the cable applies, you know, that's applied to the body. Uh, by the cable. And second, we want the vector uh, from P to B. Okay, so um, to figure out the force vector that that cable applies to the body, we know that the tension is T, that's given. Um, and so all we need is a unit vector. We know that the force vector is going to be equal to T, the magnitude, times this unit vector in the direction of the force. Um, here's the coordinate system. The cable applies a force away from the body, so it's going to be in the first quadrant this way. And so to get from the positive x-axis to the vector is just positive 45 degrees. Um, so that unit vector is just cosine of 45, sine of 45. And so the force vector is just that times t. So 0 0.7071t, 0 0.7071t. And then a vector going from P to B. So uh, the easiest way to do this is just we already have the coordinates of T. If we calculate the coordinates of B, we can just um, take B minus P, and that will give us the vector. So we have the coordinates of P 
we want to get the coordinate of B. Um, well, what we're trying to do um, we have the coordinate system here. Um, the coordinates of this point, let me move this a little bit. Okay, so what we're looking for is this vector, 2b, again, 2b from the origin. This red vector is the coordinates of B. And um, that is equal to a vector going from the origin to A. Plus a vector going from A to B. from A to B is easy to find because we know the length and we know the angle. Uh, a vector going from the origin to A is given because we have the coordinates of A. So um, we can think of the coordinates of B, which is a synonym for, you know, the vector from the origin to B, is equal to the coordinates of A plus the length of the cable, I think it was 0.5, times cosine and sine of 45. The coordinates of A are 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 times cosine and sine of 45 is 0 0.3535 for each component. And so the coordinates of B are 0 0.9535, um, 0 0.7535. And then the vector that we want um, is B minus P, so that's 0 0.9535, 0 0.7535, minus the coordinates of P, 0 0.05, negative 0 0.2, and so that's 0 0.9035, 0.9535. 9535. So, um, anytime you want to find a vector from one point to another point, you can do it by making a bunch of checkpoints along the way and then just connecting the dots, adding those vectors one by one because the rules of vector addition. Any questions about that one? Any other homework questions? Okay.
Could you get in trouble if you made yourself an all your own personal flying drone, like transportation vehicle you could fly in to like let's say the U? Uh I would guess so, but I don't know why. But it seems like you get in trouble for anything that people haven't seen before. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, re I remember hearing something about this guy who had a like business plan that during the winter he was going to fly beer to ice fishermen using a drone, and they and like Homeland Security shut it down, like. A certain height, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, there you go. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, okay. 10,000 feet is plenty high to go in a homemade drone. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Some some limit. I remember hearing something about a uh, a guy. I don't know where he was from, but I'm gonna guess Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that a real story? Yeah. <laughs> so he attached weather balloons to like a chair, like, and. And a shotgun. It was a BB gun. BB gun to control the height. And so, <laughs> so he's like, "Oh, if I get too high, then I'll, or when I want to come down, I'll shoot the balloons. Like I'm gonna hang out up there." But he like took off so fast, apparently, that he was just terrified. And then he was too high to like, "I'm not shooting at balloons now. Like if I fall, I die," you know. And so, I don't remember how it ended up. I guess eventually they just go flat. Did someone come and rescue him in a? Hot air balloon or something. <laughs> In another chair with weather balloons? What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, now um, we're done with particle kinematics. Now we're going on to particle kinetics. Mm. Oh yeah, goblin, green goblin. Hmm. Huh. I don't know. Do it. That's a lot of street cred. Like you immediately have a uh, have a place in the engineering community at the U. I mean, I don't know if the professors would care, but the... yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know about that, but the, definitely the other people would be like, the other students would be like, sure, you can eat lunch with us. Yeah, sure, you can work on your problem set with us. You know, I think that is about all you'd get from it. Professors would be annoyed by it because they're annoyed by everything. <laughs> That's true. Make it folding. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> oh, that's the only issue? That's the only issue. <laughs> okay, so particle kinetics. Now, um, we're going to... So particle kinematics is just tracking the motion of objects. Um, now, uh, we're going to include the causes of motion. And uh, we're going to keep using everything that we did in particle kinematics.
So that includes um, that includes uh, taking time derivatives and integrals. It includes the chain rule thing if you have something expressed in terms of a position variable. Um, it includes relative motion and circular motion. We're going to keep using all that stuff, but now we're going to deal with uh, masses and forces. Um, so kinematics and kinetics, it's annoying how similar those words are. Um, I think of it as like, so one of them is simpler and then one of them just builds on it, right? The simpler one is the one that your ma could do. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean anything personal, but I guess that is what I. Um. <laughs> okay, not your ma. Yeah. Everyone else is there. Um, and so we're going to use for particle kinetics. Newton's second law. <laughs> You've never heard of him before. He was sort of an obscure historical figure. Probably in some marketing related way. So uh, I'll abbreviate that Newton's second law and um, that says that if you add up all the forces, um, the sum of those forces is equal to the mass of the object you're isolating times the acceleration. Uh, for now, these are particles, but I'm just so particles only exist at a certain point. But I think it's worth thinking of that always as the acceleration of the center of mass because when you're dealing with rigid bodies, every point on a rigid body has a different acceleration in general. And it's on, this only works for the center of mass. And whenever you use Newton's second law, or the moment equation, the sort of rotational version of Newton's second law, You must draw a free body diagram. So I'm going to start uh, by giving the rules that I want you to follow for free body diagrams in this class. And I think and hope that if you follow those, that'll be good for you know anybody in the future, your future classes. Um, There's one exception to this. Uh, if you're using Newton's second law and you're not breaking the forces up into individual forces, you're, the question just asks about F net or it gives you F net, you can skip this. The whole point of a free body diagram is that it lets you um, be clear to yourself about what all the individual forces are that, that's acting. There's no reason to, you know, what does a free body diagram look like if you're lumping them all into a single F net? It just, there's a force vector on, on your outline. It doesn't help you with anything. Yep. Yes, then, because then that friction force is breaking it up into individual forces. So, yeah. So, let's just say, unless you're looking for F net. Okay, so rules for free body diagrams. Um, I'm going to abbreviate that FDD. Um, so, first, draw a closed outline of the chosen body.
yeah, that's okay. Um, but the idea of the closed outline is that the whole benefit of a free body diagram is that you're being clear to yourself about what's inside. You're, a free body diagram is only useful for its boundary. Um, you want to be very clear to yourself about what the boundary is, what's inside it, and what's outside it. You're dividing the whole universe up into stuff inside your boundary and stuff outside. And so if you are doing, you know, the force is acting on this person and you do something like that, um, yeah, there's no inside and outside to a picture like that. And so that's what we want to, like, preserve. We want the idea of very clear... Um, Boundary separating those two things. So don't do that. Um, and uh, there should be no internal details. And no external objects. Um, so internal details Aww. okay so, <laughs> so don't do that because that stuff like I said the only the only point of the free body diagram is to be clear about what the boundary is. You don't care about any of the stuff going on inside. Um, and then external objects. Don't do that. Um, yeah, <laughs> nothing like that. You know, this is probably the most common thing people do is just draw the ground or whatever. That, that just raises questions like, wait, are we isolating the surface of the, of the grass here? You know, it confuses you when you're trying to figure out what forces are applied to this thing and it confuses people who look at your free body diagram. Yes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if you isolate a wall, like that's an example of the kind of thing that being pretty uh, strict about your outline rules um, helps you with. So let's say that you have, um, so you have some object here and it's hanging from a cable there and a cable there. Okay, so if you want to isolate the thing and the wall, you need to figure out where the boundary is. So, you know, you could, you could isolate this like, like that, you know? This makes it clear because what we're going to do when we look for contact forces is we're just going to imagine going around the whole boundary. And if you're closed, so the outline has to be closed. So at some point you have to connect the outline from here to here, you know? And so when you look at this, you realize, oh, if I isolate this, I'm going to have to somehow deal with the force of contact between this part of the wall and the part of the wall that's connected to it, you know? And, you know, usually that would make you think like, Ugh, I, you know, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but this is how you would do it if you, if you included part of a wall or something, yeah. So how would we draw that? What's that? Would we include the table? Yeah, uh, you, it's totally your choice. Um, you, 
I mean, anything that you can draw a closed outline around, a valid thing that uses a free body diagram. That, that, um, any of those are fine. But what wouldn't be fine is um, You know, that's what we're trying to avoid is like, where does this, you need to know where the boundaries are. Are you in your head? Are you loosely thinking of including the wall in that or not? You got to be clear to yourself and to, for me. Yes. Yeah. And in a lot of problems, yeah, you're going to have to isolate more than one thing. Each free body diagram you draw corresponds to one use of Newton's laws. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll go through all that. Um, that, that kind of... That specific one can be sort of a pain because physics people tend to write it as the force by this object on this, and engineering people tend to write it the force on this by this. Yeah. But well, really, uh, not everyone unless there's only two professors. The rest are repeats of those two. If you... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to give you the way I do it. Uh, if you want to write it the other way, I mean, you can always just write the subscript as like on A by B, just write out on and by or whatever, and then there's no, nobody's confused. So I, I don't care what notation you use, um, but I'm going to give you the way I do it. Um, okay, so that was step one. Step two is you're going to include every force acting on the object. Well, let's say every load, and by loads, I mean um, forces and also couples. Um, So this is everyone acting on the chosen object. Um, and sometimes you know the direction of these loads, sometimes you don't. If the direction is known, Um, then draw an arrow in that direction. And label it with a scalar. That can be a number or um, a constant or a variable, but it has to be a scalar. You don't, you wouldn't draw an arrow and then put a vector variable there because the arrow gives the direction. The only other thing you need if you know the direction is the magnitude. Um, and then so you so in that case, you would do it like this. That's a scalar. Okay. Um, and then the arrow and the, since the arrow, you can think of this as a unit vector, these two together give you a vector. But um, this is just a way of keeping track of how many variables you need to solve for. Uh, and then if the direction is unknown, Um, uh, 
draw little vectors in the axis directions. So people do this differently. Some people do it. I do it like this. I just draw like a little coordinate axis. Or some people do it like this. Um, and label it with a vector. Um, so how do you know if you've dealt with all the forces acting on a body? Ron. <laughs> um, so how do you know if you've addressed all the loads acting on the body, on the object? Um, well, First, deal with body forces. That's almost always just gravity, but it can also be magnetic fields, uh, uh, force fields, uh, I mean, uh, electric fields. Um, so the weight, that's easy to take care of. <clears throat> What? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And then once you've dealt with the body forces, now just like uh, imagine going around the outline. Uh, um, and there are loads at each place. The surroundings contact the boundary. And once you've dealt with those things, you're done. In 3D, you have to imagine going around that full three-dimensional boundary. In 2D, you just have to go around that uh, the line, you know. But so if you think about this guy, so uh, there's weight force acting down, and then you just trace around this line looking for where the surroundings make contact. Uh, you know, he's holding a fish, so that's, you know, there's, I know, because we isolated only the guy, but he is. He's smoking a cigar, so there's a force there, some kind of force, you know, and uh, what kind of force these apply just depends on the rules for these things. He has on a fedora with a long tether. Um, so that's a force. Uh, a cigar smoking fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> that's included. That's that's part of our system. That's inside the outline. So yeah, what about the fact that like his heart's pumping blood and blood's going through? No, that stuff is all inside the boundary, so it doesn't show up. Okay. So you just go around, fish, hat. Cigar, ground, ground, done. Okay? So if you're systematic about it, it's easy to know when when you've dealt with everything that you have to. What if something's leaving the system? Uh, like he's peeing? <laughs> well, then uh, you have to, um, you do have to deal with that. So that would be... Like at the so this this only represents a single instant, okay? So at that instant, the the p that's outside the boundary is applying some force, and and you'd have to put that in there. Yeah. Nope. That's right. That's 
you do have to do that kind of stuff in thermal in thermo, oh, wow. where you uh, choose a control volume and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll do a lot of examples. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was fast. <laughs> you just it, uh, yeah, that happens. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, see you Friday.